Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Well, welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for being with us today. With me are my co-hosts, Manisha and Shiloh. How are you both doing this uh, fine Tuesday evening? You're doing great. Thank you, Henry. Hey, Manisha. Hey, Shiloh. Hey, Henry. So now I know Shiloh is getting cooked in down there in, in San Francisco. How about you, Monisha? How's the uh, how's the weather there? Right now we're getting the outer bands of Philippe that's passing through the tropical storm. Oh, um, okay. we're not taking a direct hit, so it's good. Mostly just uh, certain areas are getting heavily flooded. So hanging in there. Well, I'm glad it's not it's a big not uh, uh, to become uh, something that uh, directly hits it. And, Hope everything, uh, hope it passes by with, you know, minimal damage to anybody theirs, especially you and yours. Thank you. And how about yourself? How are you? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. We just had a couple, couple of days of rain. So, you know, in the highs in the, just in the seventies, which is not, is not bad after the, uh, the summer we had, I've never been a, ever since time in Iraq, I've never been a fan of the heat. I, if it was 55 degrees all the time. I would be perfectly happy. Um, so we are here uh, tonight to talk about uh, trans rights in the military and dealing with uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, but we're also here to talk about the culture and the hardships that come for um, uh, that come for trans folks for queer folks, for non-binary folks. Um, and the, that culture is something that, that we can't afford to ignore. Um, Shiloh, I know you mentioned in your notes about that the, you know, is, are, are we to, um, are we to be happy and say rah, rah when queer people and trans people are brought into the military when it, we know that it we're bringing them into an organization that even without all of the other hardships of the military, that those are ever present. Where are we supposed to, where we best put our energy in those moments? Um, I, for one, you know, like in terms of the, you know, doing this podcast is that the first and foremost, we come into it from anti-war, anti-imperial type ways, but, and then, and please, please expand on this. If you guys have uh, a different opinion that number two, we also have to recognize that the military goes on, even though we have taken this very large step away from it. And we advocate for people generally to avoid joining the military, uh, to look at how the media and how the uh, United States government presents those things to people. We have to be real about that is that the military does go on that the missions as for as as useless as we might see them continue and i think that that means we have a responsibility to try in that space in some way to advocate for those kind of things because we know we also know that culturally speaking that when big changes happen in the military eventually it does change us culturally in the u.s sometimes it takes a very long time and sometimes the change is not what we would want it to be yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, you know, <laughs> like what True. happens first is a military change and then society uh, adjusts or does society kind of push the military to do what I would call a PR stunt to legitimize itself to, to meet where society's at. We see so many times over and over as they did, as the military did with um expanding, expanding to um, include women into the military, expanding to include um, black and brown people into the military. It's just the expansion of who they're allowing to be part of the empire. And it's, it's more as a PR stunt to legitimize an organization that is illegitimate on its face. Those are my initial, my initial thoughts on it. Here's what you think, Slanisha. I totally agree with that. Um, I think going back to the chicken and the egg concept, 
if we look at history, the history of exploitation, the history of um, the way that the U.S. government intentionally creates these, um, how would you call them, tensions between groups, right, that have been categorized and scapegoat. And then when the that becomes unpopular, then they turn in that PR stunt and then act as if they're, you know, I feel like it's, people talk a lot about the white man's burden. And I feel like there's also like the cishet patriarchal burden that they put on themselves of, you know, and I think also it becomes kind of a useful tool in their propaganda that um, they use to bolster support for the their invasions um, and neocolonialism that they're doing. Because when you look at what's happening in some of the spaces that are being invaded, what are they using as excuses? Women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, et cetera. So, yeah, I I agree. And I do think, though, to what you were saying, Henry, about how changes in the military can end up creating changes in society, um, I think in a way that can also be true because look at how we were changed by our experiences in the military. Not necessarily that there's an example set by the U.S. military. And of course, with the heroic ideal and the hero worship and all that nonsense, certainly people emulate things. But I think the way that we have been exposed to certain types of behaviors, the way that the hyper-masculinity, the toxic masculinity exists there. And that is a space where People are pushing back against it, which ultimately pushes back against the very fabric of the nature of the U.S. government, the U.S. empire, and the military itself. Um, so I think it, it's kind of like a a both and situation there. Yeah, I, I, Shiloh, I, def, I definitely acknowledge the um, queer washing that is done by the empire to try to. Uh, like you said, Monisha, that that we're we're trying to put these ideals out front and center, and it's those ideals that end up pushing someone to um, support a military endeavor. You know, to support, like right now, what's happening with Ukraine and Russia to support um, pushing against Russia when they when the answers about about that conflict that they if you only listen to the U.S. ones are only going to see one side of it. But I, I, I will acknowledge, and I think this is, I don't know, I don't know that this is people really grabbing for the morality of it or just because they've heard it enough times, but that you do see people sometimes in online spaces who have, through the experience of being in the military or maybe being out of it, that they, because they saw how the military created spaces for people to be demonized and um, seen as, as less than. And I, I think you saw a lot of that while Trump was in office, you know, that, that the, the idea of living in a multiracial society was much easier to be grabbed onto. But of course, we're talking about, you know, 70, 75 years since the military was integrated. You know, is, is, is that a result of people saying that they genuinely believe that everybody should be treated respectfully and attempt to be understood in their own space or is it just that the idea has been hammered into a much like if we were to look at you know like martin luther king junior day that it creates a very small um compartmentalized memory that tries to replace what the reality is and the reality is never purely black and white but you know, so many aspects of the military are like that. This person, you know, got this medal for this thing. And it's the, the compartmentalized nature of it gets grabbed onto by people and they attach it with meaning to things that shouldn't have that meaning. So Shiloh, can we talk a bit about the history of queer and trans people in the military? Um, you know, what's, uh, what were some of the some of the hardships that those folks went through way back when, especially during a time like you had made a note in here about that many women dressed as men to participate in the Revolutionary War, and certainly I'm mean, sure many other conflicts. Please let's 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 talk about that a bit. Yeah, I'm going to give like a very brief small history. Uh, 
maybe not many things to remember is anytime we're talking about like queer and trans history in any sector is to just always remember like queer and trans people have always been a part of that sector because queer and trans people have always existed and so a lot of people will um you know say that being queer being trans is is a new thing blah 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 whatever uh but we just yeah we need to remember that uh queer and trans people have always existed and so with that you know queer and trans people have always been a part of u.s military and, and militaries around the world and um so yeah, in the Revolutionary War, um, we saw a lot of women dressing, dressed as men to participate. Um, you know, the term trans uh, wasn't wasn't used, and so we don't know if they're trans or not. Um, the first uh, first known trans man in the um, Union Army during the Civil War was Albert Cashier in 1892. Like the policy. There was a policy explicitly banning um, queer and trans people. I believe they used the term um, cross-dressing at the time. Uh, and folks are being discharged, uh, often with penalties. Uh, maybe they had to like pay back anything that they had any um, anything that they had received for their service. Uh, and then in World War II, we saw. Uh, not just in the military, but for military sake, um, they started classifying uh, being queer trans as a mental illness, and that mental illness would automatically disqualify you uh, for serving in the military. Um, so it's kind of this is where it gets kind of interesting, right? It's like, does the military influence society? Does society influence military? Because we also see that. Um, during the time, you know, of World War II, where uh, being queer and trans was was seen as a, a mental illness, we're seeing that garbage being spewed by by a lot of ultra conservative people now. And then in in 1993, we had the infamous "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" policy, um, which lasted until 2011. Um, uh, this actually, I, I served uh, my entire time in the Marine Corps under "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," and uh, as many people know, like you know, that policy kind of forced people to be back in the closet. Um, you weren't you weren't allowed to ask anyone if they were queer, or trans, and you also weren't allowed to like tell anyone that you're queer, or trans, because then you could be forced out forced pay back any benefits that you acquired um it was a really really like nasty awful time to be queer and be trans in the military um i don't know at the time like me personally i wasn't really out to myself so i certainly wasn't like out to anyone else um as far as being trans um so i yeah Personally, I, I just kind of flew under the radar, but I saw a lot of a lot of people really being harmed by that policy, and um, it was just a really nasty time. I wanted to take a little more time with that with uh, "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." Um, you know, I I knew a few people who were gay during my time in the service, and I was already a very quiet person to begin with, so they were people that I didn't. I didn't necessarily know very well, but because we, you know, went in the same social circle, being in the same unit that you, you under, understood that that was what was happening. And sometimes the great links someone would have to go if there was a accusation to try to clear it up or try to, to, you know, bring it back to zero for a, for a second. Um, I'd really, you know, can you tell us about what what that was what that was like? Not and not just necessarily for you, but the, you know, anybody else that you saw in service in a in a similar spot. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different things throughout the history of the military where specific groups are targeted with either that they have a mental illness, uh, possibly a personality disorder. That's the one that we saw, you know, big time during uh, the beginning of Iraq and everything. Folks coming home with horrible PTSD, or they may be dealing with undiagnosed TBIs. 
and then they are just out. And depending on how they left, they may or may not have gotten VA benefits to help them with whatever injuries were going on there. Um, but it was, it, I, it was during, during my time in, you know, I didn't, didn't realize how deeply, um, disturbing and damaging the policy was because it was that hands-off policy. We're just not going to talk about it. We're just going to pretend that it doesn't exist. You'll pretend it doesn't exist. The army pretends it doesn't exist and we try to move forward. And, um, that, that did, it did nothing other than, like you said, that to force people on penalty of losing their career or to be ostracized by their unit. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about, about that time if you could? Yeah. I, and for me, like as soon as, as soon as I caught wind that the, my benefits could be taken away, I just, uh, yeah, went like so far into the closet and just, uh, because I had very much been lied to by my recruiter saying that I wouldn't be deployed. And, you know, six months after boot camp, I was deployed. And, and so I had access to, to, to benefits at that point, you know, after, and so I was like, oh my God, like every, you know, the things that I went through could be just taken away. And that was enough to just scare the whatever out of me. And just, yeah, I, I had a, a boyfriend and it was just like, King, you're not going to catch me. Uh, but yeah, I think any, there's like a organizational or societal, like willful ignorance of, of something it, it just changes the, 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 what do you call it? Like, so just the whole outlook of the organization, like humanize things that, that aren't out in the open, you, you know, it's, uh, queer and trans people became like, you know, like the boogeyman. It was just this, like, because the, because we weren't, we weren't represented at all. We weren't seen at all. And so when, when the, you know, when things are ignored, they, Sometimes they come bigger than bigger than what whatever you see them as. I I just remember it being a very um, scary time. There were there were people. Um, I think he was actually a little bit, uh, maybe a year or two before me in my unit, who had orders to deploy and came out, and he was he was thrown in the brig and. Um, treated very unfairly i i've kept up with him a bit he's just like accessing uh, his benefits and and care uh i think that that ostracizing within an organization causes its own trauma and um yeah and it's it's trauma that you couldn't seek care for because if you sought care for it you would out yourself um, or you know, if you did out yourself, then you don't have access to care. <laughs> so it's kind of this circular problem. So then we come to um, both the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Trump ban and the Biden uh, repealing of, of the policy. Did, what, what do you think, and you don't have to touch on each of them, just, just whatever, whatever sticks out to you, but the, um, in terms of really advocating and allowing spaces for queer folk versus more of that window dressing, what would you say? Where, where, where did you, do you see those policies more leaning? Did you feel that, that there was some brave moments that people actually stood up and it did something or despite words, was it just, a, a um, an anti-smear campaign for the military? Was it just queer washing yeah that's a very important question and topic to talk about uh i think obviously with the uh so-called trans ban um from tr from trump in 2017 that that you know that could only cause harm to the queer and trans community and that was its purpose right it's the 
ostracize a, and demonize a already demonized group of people. Um, and then we had, yeah, we had Biden in 2021, I think in his first five days of office, like revert to that trans ban. And uh, all of a sudden, like the community is supposed to be celebrating, but I very much wasn't celebrating. Like it just says, I uh, got rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I had just got out of the Marine Corps uh, like four or five months before that. And so I was I was in San Francisco when that happened, when the Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed and people were celebrating. And I felt like a party of one celebrating. <laughs> like, why, why are people excited that that our community gets to involve themselves in the empire? I, I just was really really awestruck by that um yeah I, I think that we have to so more on like your question about like did did biden reversing that like did that further anything for the queer and trans community and the, the answer is in my opinion is very much no i think it's um it's just important to remember that inclusion into any like any sector of mainstream society is is going to be pushed through uh mainstream media through like the most milk toast version possible so sure. in other words to to make the argument of queer and trans people being included in the military to make that palatable the story is going to be pushed through the most acceptable quotes uh narratives and identities so like white trans men or white trans women who are like gung-ho and just want to serve the their country and you know live up to all that all that nonsense um so the the narratives are always going to to push expanding the idea of like who's deemed acceptable to work for the empire and like mainstreaming specifically in the context of u.s military is the idea that like there's there's subgroups of people who are seeking liberation um and, and so they can be included in the institution so long as like all of their politics and actual needs are just totally vapid and like <laughs> you know don't exist the mainstreaming of of that subgroup like queer and trans people it just all it does is legitimize the institution so it legitimizes the military because society by and large has said you know queer and trans people a exist b have a right to exist and and so the military is like all right cool then we'll include you and we'll be seen as this like liberatory place and place of opportunity we have to be better at being critical of that um not just in the military, but in, in any aspect, right? And so um, have to be critical and see it on its face as just a PR stunt. And yeah, um, all the while, right? Like they're just completely ignoring the actual real needs of, of communities. And we know that despite, despite the right wing's um, penchant for talking about the woke military, you know, that the, the, this idea that the military is is such an accepting place and such a a uh, place where they're welcome that it makes it it would demonstrate the military as being woke but we all know that like even if we went to something um somewhat separate but but definitely has a bigger platform within the military about talking about sexual assault we know that the amount of briefings or teaching or training that anybody is going to get is going to be minimal if 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 not just a, a check the box situation but this idea of it being presented as, as as something that it's entirely not just for that political demonization factor you know that that you know trans folks are at right now at you know at, at an incredible level of danger for our in living in our society just living just day-to-day -day normal stuff normal neighbors, normal things, it, 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 uh, it is a really, really hard time for it. And yet people like Trump keep reaching for it as a easy demonization because there are going to be right-leaning people who have, okay, we, we've accepted people of 
color in the military or we've accepted, accepted women advocate for that in some small, simpleton kind of way. But it's much easier to demonize the trans folks and for or queer folks and for them to become a temporary stand in for where people of color might have been or even side by side because you don't know what the dynamics of the people in that particular unit might be. It may just be a horrifying place for anybody that is not a straight white cisgender male, um, especially if you're dealing with combat units and, and people that are, you know, that have to get deployed together. Um, do you think, uh, Shiloh, do you, do you think that there is any redeeming aspect to trying to reform the military from within, not, I mean, I mean, specifically about this, but also, also in general, if you have any thoughts. I want to say no with the, with a small asterisk of like, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, that we should stop fighting for the queer and trans people who are already in the military. Right. I think that sure. kind of scene is like, ah, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're wanting to get rid of the military, then like you're just kind of writing off the people already in the military. It's like, no, that's not the case. We want to keep making sure that they're as, as safe as possible um, and able to access benefits while they're in the military. Um, yeah, you can't, you just can't ignore the the big reasons that queer and trans people disproportionately join the military also. And so, um, no, I think it's a, it's a, what, what, I can't remember the euphemism. It's like going upstream without a paddle to try to reform the military uh, from within. I think it's a, gosh, it's a, honorable leg to stand on but i don't think it's it's gonna get you very far um it's just the culture right it's a you'd have to undo the en entirety of the military culture to make it a viable place for people to 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 thrive like it's just it's just not gonna happen yeah it's, <laughs> what do you think monisha i completely agree um and I think, too, if we go back to why the U.S. military even exists in the first place, it's a settler colonial mechanism. And when we go back, like, all the way back before the U.S. created itself, before all of the other um, colonizers came, and you have the original peoples who existed here first, and then you had the absence of that settler colonial binary imposed upon them. Um, so I, I, I'm all for the abolition of the U.S. military. I'm all for the abolition of the settler colonial state um, that deploys said military, that created the military specifically to, to kill indigenous, black, queer, trans people in other places that it just wants to dominate, you know? Um, had I been out to myself at 17 years old and earlier actually when they started recruiting me in high school as a child um had I been aware of the nature of the country I was born into um and what the implications of that are for people I don't think I would have joined um and so now like hindsight is 2020 as they say and being out, being queer, being uh, a survivor of military sexual violence, being Puerto Rican, you know, being from a colonized community um, where we also live with the environmental damage, just like communities in the U.S. do. Um, like I'm thinking of a, one of the towns in California, actually, that's a super fun site. Um, and it's a predominantly Black populated town. Um, so. And thinking about can the U.S. mill is it worth reforming? No, um, I don't think for any of us in targeted existences, targeted identities. Um, if I can be just frank, I don't. I don't think that we should be taking that bait. You know, 
and thinking that, oh, as long as we only make our own personal conditions better and we make our own personal lives a little bit easier, the rest is fine. And we just ignore or don't allow ourselves to be confronted by um, the realities of what our supposed liberation means for others. It means that to make ourselves more liberated, in air quotes, we are taking the liberation of others away from them. We're harming other queer people consistently. And for what? So that's how I feel about it now. Um, and I do agree with, with you, Shiloh, that it doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and just assume that the lives currently trapped inside the U.S. military are not worth trying to, to rescue. And, you know, like I was mentioning before, you know, we have come into the awareness that we have now because in large part of our experience as well in the, in the military. So I think that that can be true for others too. And there has to be a way for us to reach in um, and try to, to bring them along, to, to try and, and expose them to realities that maybe they haven't been exposed to before. Um, and then when we get out and then we're in the next level of the struggle with PA care and healing ourselves and, and, and all of that, you know, that's another potential net that that we can uh, cast you know and try to catch people and, and bring them into a, a more uh, honest and critical reflection of what it means to be queer in the U.S. military I, it's important to also talk about like why are there so many queer and trans people in the military um and there are so many reasons, uh, you know, we're, we are disproportionately represented in the U.S. military. Uh, uh, and we're targeted by military recruiters largely because of the, you know, there's not those societal need, our, our needs aren't being met by society. Um, and so... I just wanted to to give a little bit of statistics around that. Twenty eight percent of LGBTQ youth experience homelessness or being unhoused, un, uh, housing instability. Thirty uh, percent of queer youth experience food insecurity. Uh, one in three, only one in three queer youth um, have affirming uh, family of origin support and then once you know once so there's all these yeah need uh just basic human needs not being met food shelter clothing viable income etc cetera, etc cetera. and then once once the queer and trans youth uh, you know they see the military as like a, a source to meet those needs um i know i did then, then they they're in the they're, they're in the rapture of of the U.S. military, and you know it doesn't get better at that point. Um, more, I think it's oh, I can't remember the statistic right now. I apologize, but the more disproportionately queer and trans people experience military sexual trauma, military sexual violence than other groups. Um, one percent. Oh, that's what it is. Seventy-one percent of LGBTQ service members report experiencing military sexual trauma. Um, and then once you get out of the military, trans and gender nonconforming veterans experience homelessness at a much higher rate, almost twenty-one percent. Um, so yeah, it's just it, the military just exacerbates any harm that you are already experiencing before you join the military and yeah i mean you can't really you can't yeah you can't really put like a statistic or number on just the trauma that is <laughs> the military the trauma that is putting on that godforsaken uniform every day <laughs> um so uh 
last thing I wanted to, to mention for today, talking about the VA, talking about what it really looks like for someone, you know, where trans people to try to get care, to try to ensure that they feel like they actually can go to these places, that they're welcome in these places to get an appointment, see a doctor, um, deal with all those, those things. And, and I don't have any statistics in front of me, but you know, veterans, we, we, all of us, um, we always end up getting so much more from our time in the military in terms of not, and not necessarily like injuries or, or disability for everybody, but that, you know, that someone might come out and just have high blood pressure. Someone might come out and have a bad back, not a horrible bad back, but a bad back and they still have to live with it. But then in addition for the folks we're talking about today, there's a, a whole host of other aspects and it's only been recently that some of those policies have changed. Um, I'm curious what you thought about the, the recent changes that the Biden administration made for queer and trans people with the VA. Um, and how does it make you feel? How does it, how, when, you know, when you're trying to get care, when you're trying to have a, a genuine discussion with the staff there, do you feel accepted and safe um and or is is it just a slightly more padded landing spot for military trauma of different kinds yeah thanks for that question um well first first i want to yeah just talk a little about the policy for active duty members because that flip-flops a lot depending on often depending on who's yeah who's in office um but it also like flip-flops on the surface level so what i mean is like uh it's a little muddled and diluted um on the surface level about like what care is actually provided um right now well as of the memo in 2021 uh the department of defense was to start providing gender affirming care to active duty service members um okay. of course you know with everything there's caveats to that um the care provided would only be for active duty members and could include uh, hormones psychotherapy what they're referring to as real life experiences and surgical intervention um these are all terms that are not used in like general care settings this is very military <laughs> verbiage uh, so what they're referring to with like real life experiences is like your gender expression so like what uniform do you wear what bathroom do you use that kind of stuff um the memo outlines uh that in order to access hormones and gender affirming surgery which they're calling uh surgical intervention um this, one must first demonstrate this is a quote demonstrate 18 months of stability in their gender um they must also seek psychotherapy through the military that demonstrates um that one they have gender dysphoria which is a term that i find <laughs> a little repulsive um and two uh, that they can demonstrate for 18 months that they are stable. Um, I'm curious after after I go off and uh, Monisha, like what your thoughts as someone, yeah, what your thoughts on those uh, psychotherapy outlines are. Um, and then, you know, because it's the military, like all this intel is shared up the chain of command under the guise of ensuring military readiness. So it's not in any other any other setting outside of the military, like that's between you and your doctor and like should not include anyone else's input, especially the military, which we know is like just vengeful and just terrible, vengeful, you know, we'll find any reason to give you shit duty, you know? And so um so that's as it stands now. Um, but in 
In February of this year, Senator Marco Rubio, with four other complete goons, submitted uh, SB 435, which outlines what they're calling the requirements for eligibility into the armed forces, and it's ostensibly a ban on transgender people. Um, there's a few exceptions um, that are outlined that are I won't go into because they're ridiculous. Um, but the bill was twice read in front of Congress and is now referred to the Committee on Armed Services. Um, hard to say, but seemingly not going to go anywhere um, as of right now. Um, but yeah, we're seeing, you know, just the general, uh, general, I don't want to say cultural shift because it's very, very much a small population that's just very loud active duty members go um so far as your question henry around like va care i can speak on my personal experience and i i go to one of the newer larger um, va facilities in palo alto which is in the bay area of california and um it's supposed to be you know it's like heralded as the most inclusive in the Bay Area, blah, blah, blah. Everyone waves their rainbow flags in June places. But once you get through the doors, it's not that it's not that place at all. Um, I'm trans, I'm non-binary. I have requested a million times over to uh, have my pronouns changed and their their response for years is just like yeah we don't have a place in our system to do that so every every uh communication with the va i'm misgendered um there's lots of somewhat like from <laughs> i can find humor in it like i'm on i'm on hormone treatment and uh there's lots of like you know just automated communications that get sent to me because my testosterone levels are not in the normal range of how the VA sees me, which is as a, as a woman, right? <laughs> and so that triggers like automatic communication to me uh, that's sent in the mail um, anytime I get blood work done, which, yeah, like I said, I can find humor in that. Um, uh, I still have to go to the women's health clinic um, to seek primary care, even though I am not a woman. Um, they provide hormone replacement therapy, um, HRT, but that is really the only trans healthcare that they provide. There, there is no, uh, no gender affirming surgery surgeries that are covered through the VA. Um, I had top surgery that I had to pay out of pocket from a private, private surgeon, uh, it was a pretty penny. And I've been denied three times for a hysterectomy. Um, yeah, just, I mean, any any other, uh, you know, Kaiser, any private health care, they provide hysterectomies for trans people, you know, under trans care, because that's trans health care. Um, but the VA does not provide that care. So, there's there's this you know as as we're hopefully is becoming becoming um clear like there's a lot of window dressing there's a lot of what's referred to as pink washing or queer washing that happens you know especially amongst um liberal politicians and liberal people where they want to say that they're being inclusive but then you just you know go one layer deeper and you see that there's actually no tangible uh shifts happening it's all just lip service that's what i'll say about the va i i, <laughs> I was yeah being clear but trying not to try not to drag them through the mud it's just like weird you know like i want to be thankful that i have the va for health care um and at the same time I'm like y'all need to do better <laughs> and step it up uh, they've been saying since Obama was in office that they are going to, quote, look into, you know, the cost benefit analysis of providing uh, gender affirming surgeries. And, you know, 
apparently they haven't figured it out yet. So, yeah. When we were, uh, last week, when we were discussing Guantanamo Bay and specific about the medical care that the detainees receive there and how under the, you know, the guise of, of, of general and specialized care that there's enough euphemisms in there to make the uninformed reader think that the U S would do more for those folks in there. And immediately upon when that, when I was reading through that and making notes, I immediately thought about how that euphemism bullshit plays into the lives of, of queer and trans folks that, you know, that, that again, someone who's the tiniest bit informed could read, you know, that, that, that they help treat gender dysphoria and they do this and they do that and come away with the idea that trans folks are legitimately getting the care that they need, the care that they would receive if they were dealing with civilian providers. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we, we live in this euphemism bullshit parade of the, of the military is because, you know, by changing the word just a little bit and then going somewhere deep, deep in regulations and saying what it really means that you can convince lots of people that something is happening when it really legitimately isn't. Um, if somebody in, um, if somebody in your unit Shiloh, you know, had a, they threw out their back or blew out a knee and had to have major medical surgery. None of those things would be gone through in a very personal and invasive way to say about unit readiness. They would just let whatever needed to happen, happen. But because we live in a society that so devalues queer and trans people, or just pretends that they don't exist, that those horribly ineffective steps are seen as, as they have legitimacy. They have, they have power in that way. And I think it's one of the, the to me, it's one of the most frustrating things about the military, but they, in order to hide, because there, we, we, we all know that the military does hide so many of these cultural destruction spheres within itself. Um, women, LGBTQ people, people of color, um, you know, it, it, there, there are so many different areas where the only thing that you can do if you want to be a part of it is you have to let go of those parts of yourself. You can't be someone who, you know, a black person in the military could not be part of a black liberation struggle. They would be told that they're, that's, that's not part of unit readiness or kicked out for some other bullshit thing. Um, and so I, I, I hope that everyone listening, that we all take the time to go through what, what, what these things are, that these, these dr window dressings that they, they fall down almost immediately on the slightest bit of context. Americans don't do context. It's not, it's just. We're taught that intellectual people or people learning new things is, it's certainly not masculine. Uh, uh, is it even American, you know? Um, but I think, uh, I think we found a good place to, uh, to stop for today. Um, Shiloh, Moesha, um, thank you for joining me. If you guys have any final thoughts, anything that you want to, uh, bring up before we stop, please, uh, please let me know. Um. But thank you so much for taking this time. And I, I uh, Shiloh, I especially want to thank you um, going through personal shit from time in the military and, and really having to delve in it. It's difficult. It's, it's, it's a hard, hard thing. And so thank you for being willing to do that. It's something that, that I think everybody on the podcast tries to do as much as we can is because we want people to know that there are those other perspectives and they need to keep looking for them that no matter what, be willing to see things at a different point of view. So anyways, I'm done pontificating. Anything you guys want to want to add? Um, yeah, a couple of things. I just, yeah. Thank you for 
Thank you, Henry, for for highlighting this. I think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you got you got to come out of the closet, and if you and the times that you feel safe to, um, and the times that you feel held and cared, and um, this podcast is definitely a you know a time that I can be loud and be myself, and uh, but like, yeah. <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of window dressings, um, a lot of uh, what I would call breadcrumbs that get left for queer and trans people in our community. And we're supposed to be happy with, with breadcrumbs. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm more of the mindset of like, give my people a fucking loaf and something. And we want our roses too. And like, I'm so tired of, the breadcrumbs you can't survive off breadcrumbs and uh yeah i i just if nothing else i think i hope people just get a little bit more critical um and, and be more critical when they see see something that's uh within the military or in a uh, u.s institution as seen as liberatory and, and just get a little more critical about it and think a little bit harder about it absolutely well, um, thank you everyone for, uh, for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the episode and hope it was, uh, was informative. Um, keep looking for, uh, these kind of shows because you guys know this is the, this is the bread and butter of Fortress on a Hill is that we want to get into real people's experiences and the experiences that are so often left out. So Shiloh, thank you. Manisha, thank you. And uh, to everybody listening, we'll see you next time. Take care. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One really powerful way to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the Reviews tab. Money is tight these days, for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny-pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that, and for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, James O'Barr, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, Helgeberg, and Howard Reynolds. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so very much. However... If Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. And